Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to those who are online. Um, right, let's begin this time with prayer and we'll get into our session. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you once again for another new day in our lives. We thank you for the opportunity to come and learn and study from your word. Lord, even as we study God, we pray that you will bring clarity, you'll bring direction. That Lord, your word will minister to our hearts. And, and Lord, uh, we thank you for giving us the opportunity, Lord, to, to walk closely with you, to learn from your word, oh God. And we come at this hour into your hands, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Uh, so we've looked at three aspects. We looked at ministry, what, what the fivefold ministry is. We looked at ministry of the evangelist, the responsibilities of the evangelist as well. Then we looked at the ministry of the teacher. We've got into the pastor. Now we've come into chapter 10. We look at two aspects. The one is the responsibilities of a pastor and two is the rewards of a pastor now if you look at your notes it's an empty page there i guess yes right so what you what what i'll do is i have put down 10 points or of responsibilities now there are many many other more responsibilities right so i didn't list down the whole thing but 10 important points on the responsibilities of a pastor and uh, you know you can make a note on your uh, on your notes that you have there, and then probably you'll get this printed for the next batch onwards, right? Uh, so just 10 points, but this is not an exhaustive list, meaning there is many more things that we can learn, many more responsibilities of a pastor, right? So if you have your books ready with you, we'll begin with what are some of the responsibilities of a pastor, right? So again, once again, this is not the only 10. There may be many more as well, right? But uh, it is encompassing most of it. Right? Okay, so let's look at the responsibilities of a pastor. Firstly, one of the primary responsibilities is number one: biblical preaching and teaching. The primary responsibility of a pastor is to ensure sound doctrine. When we say biblical preaching and teaching, it simply means to ensure sound doctrine. We can, we can be sincerely right, and we can be sincerely wrong as well. Now Paul is writing. Let's read uh, a couple of verses. There are plenty of verses where Paul is writing in First and Second Timothy and Titus and other scriptures as well, where he is exhorting Timothy and he's saying, Timothy, whatever you do, Make sure you teach the sound doctrine, right? Make sure you're in line with, uh, with, with the word of God, right? So let's read Second Timothy four two. Let's read also read Titus one nine. Second Timothy four two. Second Timothy four two. Preach the word. Be ready in sermon and out of sermon. Repro rebuke rebuke and ex exhort with complete patience and teaching right preach the word in season and out of season right. so, so paul is saying to timothy listen preach the word in season out of season rebuke that includes what correct rebuke encourage with great patience and careful instruction Right. Read Titus one nine. Yeah. It says here, verse nine. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy saying of the message right and he goes on so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose them look at what paul is saying now he's talking to titus again even in two uh, titus 2 verse 1 he says you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine so there's so much of emphasis that paul is giving to sound doctrine 
Now, both Timothy and Titus have a pastoral role. And he's writing to them, your number one responsibility in ministry, biblical teaching and preaching of sound doctrine of God's word. Right? That, that is number one on your list. If you and I want to be a pastor, if you and I want to serve in the pastoral ministry, we must ensure sound biblical teaching and preaching. Why? Because what we say is going into people's minds and into people's heart, and we don't want to take them, sway them away from God's truth. Remember, all through the Old Testament, there are false prophets emerging out of, out of Israel. The New, New Covenant, there are false teachers coming in. In Thessalonica, that was a problem. In Corinth, there was a problem. Ephesus had that problem. False teachers coming up with their own doctrines. So Paul is saying, as a pastor, as a leader, ensure sound doctrine. Right? So this is the main responsibility of a pastor. Right? Two, second responsibility. Now, it's not that this is an order. Right? Uh, I've just put it down together. Second responsibility is shepherding the flock. Let's read First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. First Timothy 5, 8. Yes. 5, 8. Chapter 5, verse 8. First Timothy 5, 8. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and in specially for members for his household he has denied the faith and is worse worse than an Annabelle un unbelievers hmm. okay let's also read first Peter chapter 5 verse 2 and 3 I'll read that be shepherds of God's flock now this is Peter's writing to the leaders of the church Right? He's writing to the leaders who are leading churches in different places. Right, He's saying, be shepherds of God's, God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. So that? Be shepherds of God's, glory, God's flock that is under your care. Now, second aspect, first aspect is the preaching and teaching of God's word, sound doctrine. Two is shepherding. We looked at the aspect of the shepherd, right? What does a shepherd do? He protects, he, he, he protects his sheep, he provides for his sheep, he leads the sheep, he leads by example, he's willing to give his own life to, for the sheep, right? So, Peter's writing, be shepherds of the flock. Don't lord over them. Just because they are under your care, don't control them, but look after them. Take care of their needs. That is a responsibility that we have. Now, when it comes to shepherding the flock, uh, you and I, especially in the pastoral care, we do all that we can to shepherd people. Now, we must understand that Sometimes people receive the care and love that we give. Sometimes people don't. Right? So we can't force. Can we force somebody to love us? No. We can just show love. Right? So there will be times in pastoral care that, that you really genuinely care and love. You're, you're nurturing somebody. But they may not reciprocate the same way. Or they may not respond the same way. That's all right. Right? What does he say? Not because you are forced to serve, Peter's writing there, but because you are willing to do it. Right. So when it comes to shepherding the flock, don't expect the same response from all of them. If you have a church of 100 people, you know all of them. Right. Mostly you'll know all 100 of them. Now, people are different. Their responses may be different. Some people want that additional care. Some people don't want. Some people are happy just to see a pastor on Sunday. Some people want additional care during the week, right? Some people go through problems, but they resolve the matter on by themselves. Some of them say, hey, I, I need the pastor. I need help. 
So when it comes to shepherding the flock, don't overpower. Don't control. Serve like as if you're willing to do it, not forced to do it. Okay, everyone with me? Okay, third point. Very important. Providing spiritual counsel. Providing spiritual counsel. Now, let's just open to James 5.14. James 5.14. Go ahead. Anyone can read that? James 5.14. In anyone among you seek, let him call for the elders for the church and let them pray over him. Yeah. And anoint, anoint, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Yeah, go on. Just keep reading that. Okay. And the prey of faith will save the one who is sick, and let and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Mm. Right now, another aspect of for us as pastors is providing spiritual counsel. Right, counsel meaning what? Suggestions. Uh, uh spiritual counsel right now people will have many seasons that they're going through many situations in life now for example a elderly couple may come and say please pray i don't know why why but i'm not getting a proposal for my son or for my daughter now we must provide spiritual counsel or there is somebody who's feeling discouraged i'm not getting a job I don't know what to do. I have, you know, I have a degree. I've, I've done my studies well. I've, I've applied everywhere, but I'm just not getting a job. What should I do? I feel discouraged. I'm not like the others, you know, living in sin. I read my Bible. I pray every day. Why aren't things happening the way I want it to happen? Or there are people who are, you know, going through a sickness or a disease. God is our healer. Yet I'm not seeing the healing. It's been five years. It's been 10 years. That's where you and I come in. As pastors, we must provide good godly counsel. Not just godly counsel. Good counsel. Practical, wise counsel. Now, here's the thing. You and I have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And so we tap into the Holy Spirit at that time. Right? We tap into the wisdom of God and say, God, I'm going to provide this kind of counseling to this person. Give me the wisdom to give the right counsel. Right Now, somebody may come up to you and say, I got a good job opportunity. It's in a different country. Now I'm confused. Should I go or no? So they'll come up to you as a pastor. They will come up, most of them. Eight out of 10 people will come up. They'll say, what should I do? Now, your counsel is almost going to impact them, impact their entire decision for their life. Right. So we must think, we must learn to give godly counsel. Now, I just want to make a disclaimer. As pastors, we don't know everything. Now, if somebody comes up to me and says, I got a job opportunity in another country, should I go? I also don't know. Just because I'm a pastor, it doesn't mean God will immediately tell me, go. No. So what I can do is say, OK, think about it. You know, what is the counsel I would give this person is I would say, listen, if you're a youth, if you're a young boy or a young unmarried, you can take some time immediately, make a decision and go. But there are certain things that you have to see. OK, how are you going to get a loan or if it's, or if it's work, then no problem you know, you're alone. But now when you have a wife or a husband and you have children, the whole story changes. So how do I do? So I give them, I, I must be able to give them good counsel. So what you do is maybe you think about it. Look at what are the pros and the cons. Now remember, God opens doors, right? But when he opens doors, he also expects us to be wise on how to step into the door, right? So some of the counsel we can give is take, you, take some time, pray. Ask God to give you a leading, 
give you a word. Let me let God speak to you. Don't make the decision for them. Now, while these kind of things happen and people will come, it's very important that we don't make decisions for them. We leave, we are called to give godly counsel, not to make decisions for them. Now, this is where we fail sometimes, you know, saying, you know, there's a proposal. Yeah, you have you both have to get married. Why? Pastor said. Now they get married. Their life, their married life is, you know, in, in sh is shattered. It's, it's nothing is going right. They're going to go in for a divorce. Pastor said, get married. What happens? Why? Why did pastor say get married? Pastor said, so we got married. We didn't want to get them married so early. They're only you know, very young still. But pastor said, get them married. No. So we are to provide spiritual counsel, tapping into the you know the the gifts of the Holy Spirit, especially the spirit of wisdom and revelation, right? Then leading and overseeing staff. Let's read First Timothy chapter three, verse one through seven. First Timothy three, one through seven. Now this is uh, I think we. We all know this passage. Uh, this is the things that Paul is writing, a list of criteria for the leaders. Right. So let's read that. First Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 7. This is, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of his bishop, he deserves a good work. A bishop that then must be blameless, the husband of a wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy or for money, but gentle and not quarrelsome, not quotums, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a non-wise lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into re reproach the reproach and the shun of the devil. Right. So now the entire passage, if you go on, so he just read the list, list of overseers. Now we talked about this. There's a pastor, there are overseers and deacons. Now, Paul has sent Timothy to a church in Ephesus where there are already overseers and deacons. That means there are already staff or leaders that are leading the church. Now, Timothy is gone and he's above them. Right? And Paul is writing to Timothy and saying, listen, Timothy, the church is going to grow. You are going to raise up many more leaders. When you raise up over leaders, overseers and deacons, these are the criteria you must have. They must have, right? When you appoint a leader, these are the criteria. And then he goes on, uh, you know, uh, he must not, verse 8 onwards, deacons likewise are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. They must hold on to deep truths of faith with clear conscience. They must be tested. And if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Well, they, in the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must be able to manage his children. Uh, those who've served well gain an excellent standing uh, uh, and, and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. So we see a list of attributes that a leader must have. Now, as a pastor, we are to be leading and overseeing our volunteer teams, our leaders, our staff. That's a responsibility that God has given us. Right? So for example, if you look at APC, we have a senior pastor, we have associate pastors. Right? Now, 
as a pastoral team, we work together, all of us. Right? Well, we all work together. Now, under us, we have volunteer teams, volunteer team leaders, right? Or, and then we have other leaders. And so what happens is when we choose leaders, we're very careful on how we choose leaders. Right? Uh, we, we try to see, OK, do they have all of this? Are they integrity? Do they have, are they sincere? Are they hardworking? Um, are they able to manage their family well? Uh, no. Are they working hard? Is it something that they want to serve willingly? Are they grumbling? Or is, is, is their heart ready to serve? So as a pastor, we, we lead and we oversee our staff. Firstly, we choose the right leaders and we oversee their lives. Right? We help them uh, to grow and to develop themselves as leaders. Next, fifth one. Prayer and intercession. Again, I'm just sharing this, it's, it's not an order. There's no such order. All of these are important. Prayer and intercession. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Let's read that. They Can I read, Pastor? Yes, please go ahead. First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peace, peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Yes. So here again, in chapter 2, First Timothy chapter 2, Paul is writing to Timothy and he's saying, I urge them first of all that requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Another very, very, very important primary role of a pastor is to pray and intercede. Now, they are two different things, right? Uh, they are common in aspect, but two different elements. Prayer and intercession. Intercession is to intercede on behalf of, you're praying on behalf of. Number one is your own prayer life. As a pastor, you and I must have a well-developed prayer life. If we don't pray, we will crumble under the pressure of pastoral ministry. If we don't undergird our ministry with prayer, it will be a fleshly effort to do the work, to do a spiritual work. You get what I'm saying? Right. Now, I may know a lot from the scripture. I can teach it. I can preach it. But if I do it on my own effort, it's a fleshly effort doing a spiritual work. So I need to undergird everything that I do in prayer. So I say, God, I'm going to go preach. I'm going to go teach. So whatever I teach, Lord, you bless the word. Minister through the word. It's not about me. It's about the word that is being taught. Let it touch people's lives. People are coming with broken hearts. They want to know you. They want to, uh, you know, they want to experience your presence. I pray that you will touch them. What am I doing? I've prepared my sermon, or I've prepared the teaching, but I am undergirding that teaching and message through prayer. Saying, Lord, you have to minister. The, the leader's primary responsibility, again, is to be a man of prayer. If we are not, if you look at the great men and women of God in church history, we have you know, frames of all of them here. Each and every one of them were prayer warriors. None of them can say that they, they didn't pray. None of them would have prayed half an hour a day. They would have spent hours in prayer. Remember, if God wants to use us, we have to sacrifice in prayer. Smith Wigglesworth, poster is right here. He prayed six hours a day. David Livingston prayed probably four to five hours a day with all his sicknesses, with all his problems in his body. Fanny Crosby spent hours in prayer before she even wrote a couple, uh, you know, songs. 
these are great men and women of God who are able to do all of this because they will had a prayerful life. If you and I are to be fruitful, we need to have a good prayer life. Now, a prayer life is developed over time. Yes? So as leaders, we can develop our prayer life. Right now, if we are praying 15 minutes a day, we can push it to half an hour a day. Then we can go to 45 minutes a day. Go to one hour a day. So, Pastor, there are people like, uh, that means they don't want to do prayer, but the, because of they want miracles, they'll go to in the prayer life. Means like, uh, like you said, there are many men of God. So they are able to do the miracles because they have a prayer life. So people will, some people they'll think like, so uh, if you want to do the miracles, so we need to pray. Means they don't, they really don't want to do, they really don't want to spend the time with God, but they want miracles happen, so they'll spend. So how can we tell them uh, what the opinion about that? Yeah, okay, that's a good question, but let me answer it this way. Two, two things I want to share. God can work in spite of us, right? God doesn't work because of us. Because I pray, there is healing. No. God can work in spite of us. For example, I can be a believer for five days. And I have a friend. This friend has, is a, uh, you know, who, who is blind for, from the time he's born. Now, I don't know anything from the scripture. I pray two minutes every day, five minutes every day. I'm just a new believer. Say, God, thank you for this day. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for blessing my family. That's all my prayer is, five minutes. Now I see my friend, and this friend is blind from birth. How many days I'm in the Lord? Five days. So I can go and say, hey, you know what? Jesus, in the Bible, he did great miracles. Now, this person doesn't even know what miracles Jesus has done. Maybe one or two he's heard of. He's not opened his Bible. But he can go and pray and say, in Jesus' name, I command that your eyes come back. Jesus can heal you. And he prays, God can heal that person. Yes or no? He doesn't need a healing evangelist to come from USA or uh, any other country to come and heal this man. So, number one, God works in spite of us. That is God's power, sovereignty. But there is also our responsibility. We talked about that, right? God's sovereignty, and there is our responsibility. Now, I can't be in a place of saying, hey, even I didn't pray, healing happened. Now, this boy says, oh, without prayer also, God healed me. So I don't need to pray. I can go about doing everything that I have to do. Just pray in Jesus' name, and God will heal. Now, I've taken it out of context. The reason I pray is not to make God happy. It is to make us come closer to God. Now, here's the second aspect of, your, of what you are saying. There are people who come because they want the healing, who pray and come to God's presence because they want healing. Now, remember, the Bible says God is a discerner of our hearts. Our life is like an open book in front of him. So he may go along doing that. God may continue to do miracles, right? But if you read 1 Corinthians, where 1 Corinthians chapter 3, talking about the judgment seat of Christ, right? You and I as believers, we'll go to the judgment seat of Christ, and our works will be tested by fire. Now, I may think, hey, I've done more than 500 miracles. But God, in the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord Jesus will test our work by fire. I have calculated, for example, Paul Emmanuel, I've calculated 500 miracles I've done. Now I've passed away, I've gone to heaven. The Lord Jesus is saying, okay, Paul, now in my mind, I've done 500 miracles. So let's test your work by fire. So he's, he puts the fire, meaning he's going to open up our heart. He's going to check. Okay. Out of 500 miracles, 100 miracles is what you really prayed for, what you really desired from me. The other 400, I did it. You had nothing to do with it. Now, in my mind, I've done 500. But God is saying, I'll be rewarded only for the 100. So 
So to answer your question, if I am going to God just so that I can see miracles, I've got it all wrong. There will be no reward in that. People may say a lot of things. People may say, oh, thank you, Pastor. They are, uh, but God will reward us. Our rewards will be only for the 100 miracles that we did. Right? That God was pleased with. Another question, also. and regarding about prayer, also, like even it's coming to even I saw many people in Bible college. So, if they had any worship tomorrow, they have to do, or if they have to preach the word tomorrow, no, they won't pray daily actually. If they have any program tomorrow, they'll start praying from today, preparing, you know, asking God, Use me, Lord. Is it correct? Or you know, they don't have any uh, relationship with God daily, but before when they know they got they, they're going to preach or they're going to worship they'll start praying. So how can we tell? See, that's a natural thing, right? So we must, that's the thing. We, we, so that's why we are here. We learn, right? So we're not to judge them, right? But what we can do is we can teach them. We can tell them, hey, just because I'm preaching on Friday doesn't mean Wednesday I should get up, pray, read Bible, ask. No, that's not how it is, right? Our identity or what we are doing is not because you know i was listening to a sermon just now in matthew in the book of matthew 24 matthew chapter 24 jesus is rebuking the disciples why he's saying they they missed the whole point of his ministry they're looking at his miracles but they're not looking at the person right so jesus is saying hey I am doing what I'm doing because of who I am, not because of the miracles. Don't look, of course, miracles are a sign, but it's out of my identity that I'm doing what I'm doing. As a son of God. Remember the crippled man? He says, your sins are forgiven. Who told you you can forgive other people's sin? Only God can do that. That's what I am. That's what Jesus was trying to say. I am God. I am able to forgive sins. So firstly, it's not about the miracle. I will forgive his sins and then do the miracle. So you and I, so for, for people who are going through that, we must be able to teach them, hey, it's not only because of the... It should be a regular routine, but when we have the times when we have to preach, teach, we go back to God and, you know, given that extra time, right? And God gives us the wisdom, okay, what example to use. He may give us a word, he may give us a certain scripture or a or a you know parable to say, whatever. He he gives us the wisdom. Now, even now, right? It's been more than 15 years of you know being here at APC. Even now, sometimes when before going onto the stage, I get nervous. Really, I do get nervous. Even now. But the moment I go on the stage and I start sharing, everything just changes. Am I nervous before that? Very nervous. So even now, I'm very careful. I make sure I have my notes ready. I put my examples there. Even if it's a tab, I put my examples there. I put example, say this. Say this. I say, say this. Do this, give this example, use this example. At this place, you use this example. This is how you end the sermon. How do you rest? Everything, I, I put it down. So I have the sermon notes there with me, but I add to it all these things. That's my responsibility. right? So the point I'm trying to bring out is, uh, now, this Sunday, I may not be preaching. Doesn't mean whole week I don't pray. Ah, no sermon. So I can relax. No, see, my my relationship, my identity is not pastor. You all call me pastor. When I go out, do they call me pastor? At home, do my children call me pastor? My, do my cousins and everyone call me pastor? Oh, hey, Paul, that's who I am. The the, the pastor is just a title. So the moment we understand that. It will change everything. Now we can't force it on people. We can just teach them. Right? So that's the most we can do. It's a relationship that they have to build. Right? Now it's not wrong, you know, it takes time for people to learn as well. 
uh, it's important to teach them, but that's important to teach them. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, one second. Up to last uh, week, uh, sometimes when we prepare for this uh, sermon or something, you no, know, there is a little bit of a uh, little in uh, fear or uh, though the sermon is uh, outline is given by God, scripture portions and what example is given by God. But before we speak uh, in wherever we are speaking, there's a little bit of you know butterfly in the stomach. Yeah. There is a little bit of you know fear thing. But what I was uh, I think I was sharing with Asapu Blessi, like after you go and stand in that particular place, definitely the Holy Spirit takes over and you know it becomes different than what I would have imagined. But uh, is it a good practice to just the first words is say hallelujah, Jesus, something so that we feel a little bit better? It's only the transition in that last minute, you know, from here till that room and from here till that stage. There's a little bit of you know uh, something just uh, yeah. little. Yeah, I, I understand my see uh Akil to to say hallelujah, praise the Lord, it's good, but these are not uh, words, uh, magical words. It's not like now, see, for example, if I'm going to go preach, I'm going on stage, right? I've done it thousands of times. Still, I've got the butterflies in my stomach. Oh, how am I going to do? Now, just because I keep saying hallelujah, praise the Lord, doesn't mean I'll feel better because they are not magical words or something. But what I do is, I, 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 something that I do, I always say is, Lord, you said when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to be a witness. Right now, there's nervousness, there's fear. Not fear, but nervousness. Uh, I thank you that when I go up on stage, when I begin to preach, you will minister. So you'll remove all the fear. Now, again, each Sunday, before I preach, I preach the sermon to myself three times. End time series, I preached it at least five times. I preached it to myself. Now, I did my part. Right? Sometimes we are confident. Sometimes we are not. Right? So I preached the sermon five times to the mirror, the entire sermon. Try to understand it five times. And so on Sunday, when I met, it was not like, oh, what do I preach? Now, the fear, that nervousness was about, oh, people, you know, stage, lightings, maybe all of those things. But I know what to say because I've preached it many times. I mean, I, I, so that's when God takes over. That will come off. Now, the moment I go on stage, I'm not practiced. I've read the sermon once. I've looked at it. Okay, okay. And then there's nervousness. And plus, you've not prepared. Then gone. So like, what is this? Right? I won't know what to say. I'll be fumbling. I'll be looking here and there. Oh, where, where, what, what should I say now? What should I say next? No. So we must prepare ourselves. All of these other things will yeah, take care. So I remember this uh, when we went for the youth missions, right? Uh, we were in Hyderabad. Now, for the past 15 years, <laughs> I've gone for youth missions and all of it. But this time when I went, I saw there was a stage and you guys were there. There were lightings. It was never there before. Before it was just, you know, a simple stage and stage lightings and all. And I came and I saw that. I said, oh, God, what is this? I'm preaching. And one hour sermon, one hour I have to preach. Now, I went back to my room and I was, I was really looking at my notes and going through it. And now... I had already prepared the sermon, but I, it was not like old oh, because lighting stage is there. I have to you know, prepare more, but there's something in me. See, I'm, I'm not a person who's comfortable to, to see all of these things, but I knew that I have to be well, very, very well prepared. I should know what I have to say, how to say it. And the moment I saw all of that, suddenly there was a nervousness and my, the people who were in my uh, room, they were pastors and they were saying, Paul, why are you getting so nervous? You preach every Sunday. I said, yeah, that's different. This is different. Now, they were not nervous because they're used to it. And for them, it, it, it was common. Right? They're used to it. Like It doesn't bother them. But for me, sometimes it used to bother me. I'm talking about last year, 2023. I'm not talking about 2013, 23. <clears throat> but the moment I went on stage, even before going, I was like, okay, God, the moment I went, everything changed. And, uh, uh, it didn't matter. I knew what I had to say. I had prepared 
and I knew what to speak, how to speak it, what example to give, how to close, everything. Because I'd prepared it. Nervousness was it there? It was there. But then I used God's word and just overcome that initial bit. Pastor, uh, as we are going to do ministry after Bible college, so uh, many times, like uh, suddenly someone told, like you have to preach, mm. and we are not prepared, mm. and uh, like uh, we have to prepare for every time now. So at that moment, what we can do? So you talk. What is the time gap? If they tell you to preach one day, two days. Maybe one hour, half an hour. One hour before. Um, now, see, if somebody asks you to share a 45 minute message one hour before, say no. Right? Because it's a long message. Now, for example, it is just share a word 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. So you take something that you already know. Right? So, for example, I go to a place and they, you know, they say, Oh, you know, Pastor, if you don't mind, just share something for 10 minutes. Now, before they didn't tell me, it's happened many times. We go for house visits or go to some families' homes. Uh, they'll say, oh, Pastor, if you don't mind, share for 10 minutes. Now, that 10 minutes, I don't have to tell them, oh, oh, you know what, I didn't prepare. You didn't tell me last time. Now, as a, as a leader, I should know. So that time, I shouldn't say, give me five minutes. I'll go pray in the bedroom and come back. No. 10 minutes, okay, what can I talk about? What is the situation? Maybe this, they have lost a loved one in the family, right? So what can I talk about? I can talk about the love of God, the faithfulness of God. Just take up any, any person from the Bible, just talk about him. 10 minutes, God is. So remember, the Holy Spirit, this is where the Holy Spirit uses what we have and brings it out. So that moment, the Holy Spirit can give you a word. And I remember went to this uh, um, um, for this fellowship once, and uh, these are children, slum children, right? And uh, it was an NGO, and the and the person there said, uh, uh, "So we have a pastor who's joined us today. Paul, can you, Pastor Paul, can you share one small word immediately, right there?" I thought to myself, "Now imagine, I can't talk about marriage and family. These boys are young." kids in their 13, 15 years old football players. The first thing that came to my mind was in the book of, uh, in the letter to Timothy, Paul writes, no, in 2 Timothy. That's the first thing that came to my mind. 2 Timothy. Wait, forget the passage. Is it first or 2 Timothy? Uh, the passage where he says uh, you run the run a good race. Is it Second Timothy. Where is that? Yeah, I have finished the race. Yeah, it's Second Timothy. Chapter. Yeah. Chapter four. Yeah, it's here. Yes. Right? Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 on. So the first thing that came to my mind was running a race. Now, these are all sports guys. So I simply, I just shared, you know, we all play to gain um, victory. Right? We like to win. Nobody likes to lose. But just to get into playing what you are playing, sports, right? there's so much of training that's involved. To train and train and train. Right? There's a lot of hard work. So there's a lot of discipline. There's a lot of sacrifice. And then when we win, we feel so confident. We feel so happy that we win. But sometimes we forget to give that glory to God because who gives us the ability to win? Who gives us the ability to breathe and to gives us? who has given us hands and legs? Ten minutes sermon, very easily it can go. Something that is relevant to them. Now, if you go to a family where they're, uh, you know, maybe they've lost a... a you know, a son or a daughter in their house. They've lost a family. You have to be able to give something to them. They say, share something. Now, if they say, if somebody comes up to you and says, 45 minutes, can you preach a sermon? You say, see, 45 minutes is too much. I haven't prepared fully yet. But I can give you a, I can just share some word of encouragement. Now, always remember this. 
a 45 minute sermon and a five minute sermon some of them may like the five minute sermon more sometimes the five minute sermon is more impactful than the 45 minute sermon right? so you you see what works right uh, uh, but don't be pressurized i have to do it be able to say no okay okay let's do one more point and then uh, we may have to stop and then pick up from next class okay next one outreach visits and outreach uh, one of the examples <clears throat> sorry one of the responsibilities of a leader is to especially as a pastor is to is to visit people to meet the needs of people within your congregation and also to come to a place where remember local church we're talking about that right we we become an apostolic church we go out we reach out so we uh, we not only build teams within the church we raise up leaders we raise up teams but we also bring that uh, matthew 25 talks about it right to go and make disciples so as pastors and leaders we don't just get people uh, to come to church and say okay be happy here this is your safe place nothing will happen to you no no god has called us to go out to reach out the principle is to go make disciples right so they, so we teach them that we as leaders as pastors we teach our congregation there will come a time that we will have to go no more will we be in one place right the commission that jesus has given us go make disciples we want to fulfill that so when it comes to visits and outreaches we build teams uh, we visit is basically to, to help us to serve the local church community outreaches is to serve the people uh, outside and bring people through christ right uh, so these are six points we'll stop here if we can just make a mark there six points and then next class we'll look at uh, three more aspects then we'll also look at uh, rewards of a pastor right right any other questions pastor oh. yes go ahead lucy pastor how do you overcome uh, missing of the points or adding uh, some other points when we are prepared for a sermon okay or giving the word of god to people yeah so lucy while preparing a sermon for example you are preparing on a certain point grace mm -hmm. right now there is so much that we can speak about right when you talk about grace mm -hmm. uh, now it's the point is we do want to make that sermon you know uh, too much for the people to bear so we must understand our congregation now you've already prepared for example five points and as you are preparing you feel that hey, this additional points are good uh now that that portion really depends on you now you must understand and you must make the decision hey if i add this point will it make sense for me to speak about it at this time right or should i add it or shouldn't i add it so this again the whole responsibility comes on you as a as a as the one who's preaching right but don't be in a position where you want to spend most of your time giving examples right and we learned about this in homiletics right uh, most of the time giving examples talking about other things the focus is the word talking about grace so if there is a time when you know you've prepared your sermon but you want to add points uh you can if you want to but again you can make the decision so during no. the message brother if we have some other points during the message or if we miss out okay when we during when, when, during during the message you miss out points that you've already prepared for is that what your question yes, is yes, yes yes brother okay so if you missed out points you, you can always go back you can just be see listen we, we are normal human beings right mm -hmm. so you can just say hey i i forgot these i forgot to mention these two points let me just mention these two points and go back and say it it's all right nothing wrong in that okay okay brother thank you no problem yeah
I just like to add a small comment to what Sister Lucy was just sharing. Sometimes I have experienced that, you know, when we are preaching, Holy Spirit will uh, bring to mind something which I have not thought or not prepared on the point. And something which I would have prepared, I would have like forgotten and thing. Then I would have felt that that's the leading of the Holy Spirit, which was suitable for that audience. Yeah, that's that's something that can be done. Yeah, that, that happens at times. Uh, yeah. Anyways, we'll stop. We have to get into our next class, but we can spend some more time discussing uh, on on Monday as well. Right. Right, everyone. Thank you. Uh, have a good weekend. I'll see you on Monday. God bless.